Church, welcome to Vision Church. If you're watching online, we're so happy you're joining in with us as well, and it's just good to be here. And I hope you feel the energy building to next week, which will be our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. It's Easter Sunday, and so as I've said before, start inviting. If you haven't, uh, keep inviting. Uh, let people know they can watch online, they can join in, but we'd love to have them here as well. Uh, and come ready to worship next week, right? Like we want to come in and not just be like, okay, I need a couple songs to warm up. We're going to come in. Jesus is alive and we're ready to sing about it. We're ready to shout about it. And, and even with that, let's not just wait till next Sunday. Let's say today we're going to celebrate the resurrection today. We're going to celebrate the cross today as we worship and as we uh, dive into Galatians. And I believe it's going to be a good, good Sunday. So let's pray together. Father, we welcome you into this place, God. We want your spirit to move in our midst. God, just have your way here. As always, God, if there's people coming in here bringing heartbreak and, and, and pain and struggle and anxiety and stress and whatever, that the baggage in their life, God, I'm praying that you would help them to let go of those things and to set their eyes on you. God, that you would meet them right where they are, that you would pour your peace over them and love and joy over them. And God, if we're coming into this place, we're just feeling great. We're loving the weather. We're loving our lives. God, let us not forget that it is all from you, that you are the giver of good gifts. And so we want to give you the glory for all of the good things in our life, God. We want to praise you for who you are. And God, just we want to focus on your character today, that you are good, that you are true, that you are love, that you are sovereign over all of our situations. And so God, help us to, to sing in faith that we trust you with our lives. We trust you with our hearts. 
God, we thank you for Jesus, that you would send him to die on the cross for us so that we can know you. Help us to not take that for granted and to enjoy him and to serve him and to live in the spirit for your will. God, we want to worship you with everything we have today. Despite what our lives look like, we're not going to hold back. You are worthy of worship. And we're going to declare that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
this morning. Lord, we don't have to wait until the 4th. We don't have to wait until Easter to remember what you've done and who you are. But Lord, you are victorious over death, every single sin, every single thing that ensnares and entangles us. Lord, you are victorious over it all. Death could not hold you. God, there is not a single thing in our life that could defeat you or surprise you or usurp you from your throne. But God, you are on the throne today, yesterday, and forever. God, nothing in this world can change who you are. But God, you are our constant. And because you are our constant, you are the same, always the same, unwavering, never changing. God, we can put our trust in you. So God, today I pray that we put everything down at your altar, at your feet today, every worry, anxiety, fear, burden, every single thing, every single moment that we are worrisome, would we leave it at your feet today? God, you are faithful and true to carry that burden. And God, you've already nailed it to the cross. So God, would we live in that victory? Would we not live slaves in bondage to our sin any longer? Lord, would we look to your word as a roadmap for holiness and righteousness? That, God, we would not look like the world, but we would strive to look more like your son. God, we thank you for this church body that we can worship, that it is a powerful name, that your name changes everything. Your blood covers everything. God, we thank you for this family, that we are united by that front, that your gospel is everything, that you are enough for us. God, if everything else is crumbling, if our financial situation looks bleak, if we might lose our job, if our marriage is struggling, you are still enough. God, would that be our hope today? That your cross, you sending your son for us, that it was enough. So Lord, as we open your word, would we be eager to hear from the one true living, holy God? God, open our ears and our eyes. People that are in this room right now are watching online. God, would would you reveal to us through your word what you want to say? God, we need you every hour, every morning, every day. So speak in the way that only you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
even when it's imperfect, even when we get ahead of ourselves. God, that you just want to hear your children praise. And then God, if we don't do it, your word says the rocks will cry out. And Lord, we do not want to let that happen. But Lord, we want to worship you, to praise you, to magnify you with everything we are. And so Lord, we surrender that to you, every breath in our lungs, every beat of our heart. God, we want it in line with yours. God, your will for this, this community, your will for the world, your will for our individual lives. Lord, that is to praise and glorify you and to see your gospel known to every tribe, nation, and tongue. So Lord, would we do that? Lord, would this attitude of worship um, go into as, us opening your word together, Lord, that that's an act of worship in itself, to lay aside our, our other wants and desires, and dig into who you are, who your word says you are, to let it be the authoritative light in our lives to reflect where we need some work and to allow you to transform and work in our lives. So Lord, I hope it blesses you. I hope this, um, this noise that we made this morning was a sweet, sweet sound to your ear that the fragrance of our praise was pleasing to you and that in turn our lives would be pleasing to you also because you are what matters most. It only matters if we please you. We don't care about pleasing man or our neighbor, but we care about pleasing you and loving others. So Lord, be glorified in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, well, hey, church, if you would, turn to Galatians 6, and our, our plan is to finish the series today. Uh, and while you're turning there, let me just remind you again, invite to Easter. People are more likely than ever to say yes on Easter, and so invite to Easter, let them know ahead of time, don't just call them the morning of. I mean, you can do that, but try to give them some time to like prepare for it, uh, but yeah, be inviting, be inviting, and 
I'm going to just be honest with you and confess to you, uh, I might have told a little fib to y'all because we are technically finishing the Galatians series today, but we're not going to finish Galatians 6 today because we're actually going to finish that on Easter uh, because Paul talks about boasting in the cross. And as I was studying this, I was like, man, this is too good. Let's talk about boasting in the cross on Easter and why we want to boast in the cross and why we're called to boast in the cross because what the cross did and what it represents and then the power of the resurrection. And so uh, I wasn't totally lying. I didn't plan on doing that, but the way I was, when I was studying, it's the way it worked out. And I think that's the way the Lord's leading us. So it's going to be good. Uh, Last week, we talked about walking in the spirit And if we do this, it will change us, man. It's going to change the environment around us, our families, our workplaces, our friendships, our relationships, uh, whatever it is. This church can change if we as individuals decide and make the decision to surrender and yield to the Spirit and start walking in the Spirit. Paul now flows right out of chapter 5, this idea of walking in the Spirit. And he wants to show us practically what, what it looks like to practically walk in the spirit and I think it's important for a lot of us because we're like yeah we love talking about like walking in the spirit and know truth and read his word and pray and do your devotionals and all of that Uh, but what is it practically to put it into practice to walk in the spirit see if I asked you right now what it looks like to walk in the spirit we would have probably a different answer every person in here would could could have a different answer what it looks like to walk in the spirit if you're a devotional person you love your devotion You love your devotional time, morning, evening, whenever you do that. You can't wait to get your new devotional. You've got like three ready on standby for when you finish the one you're on now, and you're like ready for that. You love your devotion. You might say that walking in the Spirit looks like better quiet times, more time spent in the devotion. Maybe not just reading my devotion to get through it, but I'm going to then take that Scripture, and I'm going to dive into the Word, and I'm going to read a little bit more than that, and I'm going to spend some time in prayer. Maybe for you, you'd say, hey, that's what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good answer. If you're a, a charismatic, you're one that's like, it's really excited, and you're more charismatic with the way you respond to your faith, uh, you might say more powerful worship experiences. When we're walking in the Spirit, we're going to have more powerful worship experiences. We're going to come in here ready, and we're going to be excited about what we're seeing, and we're going to be shouting and, and, and just really believing and going for it when we come together to worship and to dive into the Word Uh, Some of you that are even more charismatic would say, hey, we need to see more miracles. We need to see more signs. We need to see more wonders. That's what we need to see in the church, and that's what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. So that might be you. Somewhere you might fit in there. Maybe you're saying, I don't fit in there at all. Well, you need to walk in the Spirit. Um, But what I want us to see here is that Paul tells us that life in the Spirit actually leads Christians to live out their faith practically in biblical community. This is really cool because when we talk about the Spirit, we all immediately think like, wow, like crazy stuff, like signs and wonders and all that stuff. And the Spirit does do that. He, he can do that. But what Paul says is to live, if a group of people are walking in the Spirit, what that looks like is biblical community. Paul speaks in this passage nothing of signs and wonders. He doesn't really talk about spiritual gifts, even though some of the things that living in biblical community require spiritual gifts. He doesn't specifically talk about spiritual gifts, but he explains that the Spirit causes healthy relationships that lead to unity amongst believers. So we can have all the other stuff, and that's amazing, but he says it starts with us being in unity and living in biblical community with one another. As cheesy it is, we're, we're doing life together, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, my heart's going to break when yours is breaking, and when you're crying, I'm going to cry, and when we're celebrating, we all celebrate together, that we are there with each other, and it's not just in those things, but even in the tough things when we disagree about stuff, how do we disagree about it? Whenever I'm caught up in my pride, how are you going to love me and approach me with that and, and, and restore me? Biblical community is what we're called to. The Spirit causes healthy relationships. Now, here's the thing. This is the kicker here. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit. And if if the churches are filled with Christians, why is there so many problems in churches? Because if the Spirit wants to lead to unity, right? We're drawn together. 
why is there so much division? Why is there so, many, so much quarreling? Why is there so many problems? So remember here in the context here that Paul's writing to the church in Galatia where the false teachers have crept, crept in and caused a bunch of confusion, and now they're all fighting with each other. There's some that are maybe still hanging on to what Paul said, and they're being persecuted. Then there's other ones that are following the false teachers. There's other ones that are wandering back to their pagan roots, and they're saying, I don't know if I want to even deal with this anymore. This is so confusing. So you have some that are falling away, and then other ones that are arguing, and Paul's writing to address that in the last chapter of this book, and he's saying, listen, we can talk about grace all day, we can talk about doing good all day, but what I want to emphasize is that what the Spirit does is it causes unity in believers. And so as we dive into this, I just want to pray, just pray over this, and just pray that we can really get this and understand this, because I believe we have great unity here as a church, but we've got a lot of new people here that we want to get you unified with us. We don't want to feel like, hey, there's this club, and then we're the ones that just come sometimes. We want to be unified and growing and discipling each other and growing together. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, God, and we thank you for Galatians. God, I'm just asking right now that this would rest on us, that it would not be something that goes in one ear and out the other, but it would rest on us, that we would feel this throughout the next week and the coming days after that, leading up to Easter and beyond Easter, that we would understand that walking in the Spirit is unity with believers. Your word says that we can do all kinds of good things, but if we don't have love, we're just a clanging gong just a loud noise. And so God, help us to walk in the spirit, which leads us to walk in unity and love for one another. And God, I'm asking that you'd bring conviction over us where we've been prideful, where we've been caught in our sin, where we've been cowards to restore another brother or sister, or where we've been defensive when a brother or sister came to restore us. God, so I'm asking that you would bring unity today. We were rallying around the name of Jesus. You are the point of everything. And so God, help us to see that. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a story one time that a woman came to a pastor and she said, Pastor, we haven't seen enough signs and wonders in our church. I think we need to be seeing more miracles. We need to see more signs and wonders. And it kind of caught the pastor off guard. And he thought for a second, he said, See that lady over there? He pointed to a woman with her children. He said, uh, they just got evicted from their apartment. He said, I would consider it a miracle if you would take them in for three months. You know, see, that's what we do. It's like, we need to see this and we need to do this. And the pastor's like, hey, listen, you want to see a miracle? You want to see a sign? You want to see a wonder? It's a unity in the body, caring for each other, bearing each other's burdens. So you see a family over here, a single mom with her kids that's just got evicted from her apartment and doesn't know what's going to happen next, where she's going to even live. Why don't you step up and walk in the spirit and in unity bear those burdens? That is what it looks like to see a miracle in a church. We desire for God to do extraordinary things, but do not undervalue practical acts of service for others. Those are miracles. Sometimes we think those are the small things. No, those are the big miracles. You know why it's a miracle? Because to take a messed up sinner like you and all of a sudden make you care about another person to the point to put yourself out to help them, sure, that's a miracle. Humans, we're sinners. That only happens by the power of the Spirit to genuinely, without expecting anything in return, say, I love this person and I want to help them. I want to bear their burdens. My goal is that if we, if we asked you, all the people here that attend Vision, if we asked you what the biggest blessing at Vision is to you, my goal would be that your answer would not be the preaching would not be the worship, even though I hope you enjoy that. My goal, that your answer to the question, what is the biggest blessing at Vision, would be other people, Amen. would be the relationships. It would be my life group that's there for me, and they were in the hospital waiting room whenever I was going through the worst thing in my life, and there would be these people that rally around me, and I can be there for them, and we can serve each other and love each other and pick each other up and pray with each other and cry together. That would be, that's my goal, and I think that's Paul's goal for the church in Galatia is that this is what I want to see. You can have the biggest church and the most attendance, and you can have great preaching and great worship. He's like, that's all great, but it's the relationships that make the church. We do it. We have a service here on Sundays, but this is not church. You are the church, and the way we love each other is being the church. Amen. So let's look at Galatians 6. Let's just start with verse 1. 
Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness and keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. First point, if you're taking notes, what does the Spirit lead us to do? To seek restoration. This is the goal of it. First of all, a Christian, a Christian mentality is a, a mentality of a restorer. Why? Because it's our story that Jesus restored our relationship with God when we were broken and messed it all up. So the identity and in the DNA of a believer that's a new creation in Christ is restoration. So we aren't looking to divide. We aren't looking to break down or tear down other people. We are looking to build up and restore people. So as Christians, and when we're walking in the Spirit, one thing that we'll see out of that is we are seeking restoration. Paul's been yelling at the Galatians, this, basically this whole book, and here we see him use that word again, brothers. That's family language. That's intimate language. That's I love you and I'm here for you. You're my brother, brothers. We need to see that the church is a family and we need each other. But just like a family, there are times for hard conversations that we don't necessarily want to have. Any of you had hard conversation in a family? Intervention with that brother or sister or that, 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 that parent, whatever it is, your child. You had to have those tough conversations. What are you doing? Why are you doing this with your life? Why are you hurting yourself? What are you... Being in a family isn't always just like, you know, sitting down, eating popcorn, and watching a movie. It, it, is, it is hard conversations. So here's the thing. If you love your brother, if you love your sister, if you love your child, you will at some point have to correct them or speak truth to them in love. Won't you? Like if you love your kid, you don't let them do whatever they want to do because they will hurt themselves. If you love a family member, you're going to sometimes risk maybe causing a little bit of awkwardness if it means restoring them and saving them and helping them. And so we as a church family have to understand that we don't go around as the righteous police saying they sinned and they sinned and we're going to hunt each other down and see what each other's doing on the weekends. I'm not saying to be the police here. I'm saying when we see a brother or sister that's falling and caught, you notice he uses that word if you're caught in a transgression, they don't want to be there. They got caught, and now they're struggling, and they feel like they don't, can't turn to anybody. That's where the brothers and sisters of the church reach out, and it says restore in gentleness. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, as we talked about. So we do have to correct each other and speak truth and love. We all know this if you've lived long enough at all, but the enemy sets traps. Sometimes we get caught in them. So one week it might be that other person over there and oh my goodness, did you hear what they did and you hear what happened to them and you hear what's going on in their life and in their marriage and in their family and what their kid did. So at one point it's them. At some point it could be you, it could be me, right? And so instead of judging and gossiping and talking about, we should say, my heart is breaking for my brother or my sister, I need to go help restore them. Notice it doesn't say go yell at them, it says restore them. We need to have family that won't just let brothers and sisters stay trapped, but will pry open the traps and set each other free. So when we go to see somebody that's fallen into transgression or sin or struggle or a trap that the enemy has set, we don't run up and start yelling at them for being in that. We go and say, how did this happen? Let me help you. What can I do to help you? You know what God's word says. You know we love you. Let us help pry this trap open and set you free of this transgression. I love the word restore. And, it, and here it's the same word used to set a fractured bone. I don't know if anybody's ever had that done. I have not. But if you've ever had to have a bone reset, I'm assuming it's not fun. It doesn't look fun on TV when they're like, bite on this, crook, you know, like, but you got to do it because the bone is out of line. It's going to cause tons of problems. So we got to reset this thing. That's the word that it says and restore them. It might be painful, but it's got to be done if it's what's best for them. Like I said, don't rush out and start just calling everyone out on their sin. That's not what Paul's saying here because that's coming out of pride. 
See, that, that's you elevating yourself and looking down and saying, they're doing that and they're doing that. and they're do-. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's saying we're brothers and sisters in a family and we see each other struggling. We know each other. So whenever I talk to you and you talk to me, you're like something, they're dealing with something. Something's not right. Family knows each other and knows when something is off. The reason I think so many people are, feel alone and hurting in a church and feel like they're just nobody cares about them, nobody's noticing what's going on in their life is because we don't really get to know each other to the point to say, I can tell something's wrong. We see here that he gives us steps for the person restoring, the restorer. So this is for us. If you see a brother or sister fallen into a trap or stuck in transgression, this is the steps that we go to to be a restorer. He says, you that are spiritual. If anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him. So you need to be spiritual. What does that mean? Does that mean you've got to have it all together? No, but it means you should be prayed up. You need to get the log out of your eye before you try to get the speck out of their eye. Like, don't go in prideful and be like this. You need to be, do like I do, and you need to get your... No, we go in humbly with love and gentleness, and we are prayed up, and we are walking in the Spirit. We are spiritual, is what he's saying there. You need to... Those that are spiritual should go to restore. Second thing, he says, be gentle. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's pretty self-explanatory. Don't rush in like crazy and just start stabbing at them and saying, well, I don't know, you always do this and you always have these. No, no, we go in gentle, ease into it. You ever seen a dog that's like scared of everybody and if you just run, at it, they're gonna bite you. Like if you're just like, why is this dog all like whimpering in the corner and you just come at them real quick, they're gonna attack, they're gonna bite and they're gonna be defensive. But you go in gentle, I love you, I'm not here to hurt you, I'm not here to bug you or annoy you. I just care about you, and I want to help you. And the last thing, and I want to send, stay a moment on this, is he says, be careful. You notice that? And keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. Be careful. What is Paul saying there? He's saying, well, it's easy if you go to correct somebody else's sin to see how good that sin is and be like, maybe it's not so bad and fall into that trap as well. You go to open the trap to let them out and your foot gets stuck in it. We need to be careful. And what Paul is saying is that you're not immune to falling. You're not perfect. You got issues. You don't have it all together. So you come running in like the hero that you think you're Superman and you've got it all together. And the fact is you're not. You are a broken sinner. And easily it could be you in that trap trap as it is them. So be careful that you're not too tempted to fall into the trap. You're not immune. Humble yourself. And I love that the order it puts in, be spiritual and prayed up, be gentle and be careful. In John 8, we're not going to turn there. We don't have time, but if you want to read it, you can or mark it. Uh, Jesus is there when they, they throw the woman that caught in adultery out before him. They just throw her in the dirt. And he's standing there and they say, the law says to stone her. And all the crowd of people are like, we get to kill this woman. This is going to be awesome. I got a big stone. This one's really going to do some damage. They're all stoked about throwing stones But Jesus didn't want to destroy her. He wanted to restore her. And I want to say that that's what our God is, right? That's that's Jesus. He is constantly seeking restoration in my life and in your life and in your family's life. Like if you're thinking right now, this is how powerful it is that God wants to use you by the power of the Spirit to restore some people in your workplace. Now, I'm not saying you go in and fix everybody. Don't be the Christian that's annoying. That's like, I'm in here. I'm going to get everybody fixed and like make everybody feel guilty. I'm saying he wants to use restoration through you, not to tear down, but to build up. Amen. He addressed the woman's sins. He said, yeah, you're caught in adultery. Like it, it's true. You got caught. We know it, but I'm not going to throw a stone. I'm going to restore you. Go and sin no more. What if the church looked like this? When we have brothers and sisters that are, everybody's wanting to tear down. And instead of us shying away and saying, I'm, like, I'm going to disassociate myself because I don't want people knowing I'm friends with them. Or I don't want them know, people knowing they go to this church because they're going to think we're just a bunch of messed up people. What if instead of pulling back, we leaned in? Like that's what Jesus did. If we look at his story and the way he walked, he leaned into the mess. He leaned into the sinners. He sat down and ate with them to restore them. 
So as Christians walking in the Spirit, we should be seeking restoration. Look at verse 2 here. It says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Second point, real simple, bear burdens. What does, the, what does it look like to walk in the Spirit? You're seeking restoration and you're bearing burdens. You're stepping up and you're aware that people around you sitting to your left and right have burdens in their life. They have things this week that they don't know how they're going to get through or deal with or things they went through last week that they don't know how they survived. So we as a church are not called to come sit and be comfortable and then leave and go on about our life and say, not my problem. No, the Spirit calls us to seek restoration and bear burdens. Think about this. If you've ever been walking somewhere and you see someone carrying something really heavy, a big old TV, a couch, whatever, and they're about to be crushed by it, you can tell they are about to drop the thing. Don't you try to help them? Like, it could be a complete stranger, but if I'm walking down Main Street and somebody's trying to carry something really heavy and they're about to drop it, I'm going to help them even though I don't know them. So if we're willing to do that, why in the world do we come to church when all we have brothers and sisters that are being crushed by burdens in their life and we say, not my problem. I, I don't need to want to get involved. It's too messy. It's a, no, no. Paul is calling us in the word of God to step in and bear burdens. So why are people in the church being crushed by things? And we're not doing anything. It could be physically, mentally, financially. The thing is, we all have burdens. And some of you think, well, I'm, I'm holding up my burdens fine. I don't know why they can't hold up theirs. I mean, you have no clue what they're going through. On the outside, you might think it'd just be struggling paying a bill or it's struggling with uh, maybe some teenager stuff, and you're like, man, I know that's just what teenagers do. I'm holding my stuff. They can handle their stuff. We have no idea what kind of toll it's taking mentally on somebody. It's not your job to sit back and judge if they can handle it or not. It's your job to step up and say, I'm here to help. So I want to challenge you, be alert to the burdens of others. It's not that hard. We just got really good at not seeing it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not hard to see people are struggling with burdens. We've just gotten really good with putting our blinders up and not, oh, I didn't know. And it makes ourselves feel better that we didn't know. No, feel bad that you didn't know because you should be alert to seeing brothers and sisters that are struggling. I want to encourage other people, if you are struggling, talk to somebody. Don't let the pride, your pride get the best of you. Reach out to somebody and say, hey, listen, I'm about to be crushed by this. But it also is not just on the person's responsibility to ask. It should be on the brothers and sisters in the family that know our brothers and sisters well enough to say, hey, they're, they're bearing something right now. They're about to be crushed. Let me help. We need to be alert to the burdens of others. Because even the strongest believers need help. We see in the Bible Moses, which we always like. You always see Moses on pictures and TV and stuff where he just looks almighty, right? Like the waters are parting and he's just like, yeah. We're like, man, that's Moses. You know, it's like Moses was not perfect and constantly needed people around him to hold him accountable and help him. And in fact, when they're fighting a war and he can't hold it together, he had men step up and hold his arms up. That he was not strong enough to hold that burden on his own. He had people around him that said, we're here to lift your arms. We see Paul surrounding himself with others that he was struggling. And you know what I love? When you see Paul writing to the church in Galatia or Rome or Corinth, he's always like, I thank God so much for you for how you've welcomed me. Because Paul had some issues. We don't know if it was his eyesight or what he was struggling with, but when he went places, people cared for him. He needed help. He needed a scribe to help pen what he was, uh, what he was saying so that he could write these letters. There is story after story in Scripture where we look at these strong people, but they needed help because they were not perfect. Look at verse 3 again. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I'm telling you, pride hinders burden bearing. 
What's up, girl? <laughs> Pride hinders burden bearing. If you're prideful, you're not going to ask for help. And if you're prideful, you're not going to think you need to help anybody. It's the not my problem mentality. I've got my stuff together. Why should I have, why can't they get their stuff together? Pride is a huge issue. That's why he says in here, he's like, listen, if anybody thinks there's something, guess what? You're not. And you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. You'd be better off to realize that I'm nothing without Christ. I'm a sinner. And so whenever I see somebody struggling, I could say, I can help them because I don't have it together either. I'm sure a lot of you have seen The Lord of the Rings. In the last book or movie, uh, Return of the King, I love the scene at the very end. I'll try not to get into spoilers, but goodness, it's Lord of the Rings. You should have seen it by now. Uh, Frodo is trying to get up the mountain to destroy the ring, right? Like, and he's trying to go up, and he is just broken. And if you know the story, he's been through so much stuff, and he is like, I can't do it. He's too weary. He can't go on. And I love that his boy, Sam, is right there with him. And with tears in his eyes, this is the most beautiful line. He looks at Frodo, and with tears in his eyes, he says, Come, Mr. Frodo, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. And he picks that boy up and walks his boy up the mountain. I just think that's so cool because that's like, that's what kind of relationships a church should look like. I can't carry your anxiety for you, but I can try to carry you through it. I can't carry what's going on in your life. I, th those are battles that you're having to fight, but you know what? I can be right there to hold your hand, cry with you, and try to take some of the weight off of you. I'll do whatever I can to bear that with you. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. Listen, life is too heavy. Life is way too heavy to do it alone. We need each other. Imagine Paul writing to the church in Galatia, and he sees so much division. People for him, people for the Judaizers, and people that are falling back into their sin. And he is broken, and you can tell that he is broken as he's writing this. He's like, brothers, like, you need to be in unity. He hates that they're divided. They need each other more than ever. See, that's what happens. You have a little bit of problem in a church or in a family or in a friendship, and there's some of these little problems going on, and it starts to divide. Man, we need to be uni uniting each other. We need to be caring for each other. So have the tough conversation. Don't just let the awkwardness divide a family or divide a church. Get in there. Get into the mess and say, we got to figure out what's going on here. We're called to seek restoration and bear burdens. One other thing before we move on is that burden bearing is not a suggestion. It's not like, hey, you're a Christian now, and if you want to opt in, you can bear each other's burdens. No, it's not a box you check. When you're a Christian, you are a burden bearer. That, that you're called to bear one another's burdens. It's a commandment. It's not just reserved for pastors. It's a command to all believers that we are brothers and sisters. It's not just a pastor trying to be everybody's brother. That's really hard. So please, help a brother out and care for each other. Uh, it helps out tons, and it's what we're commanded to do. Let's look at verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Amen. This is the thing with the church. We don't give up. We believe that God is bringing the harvest, and we're going to get to work, and we're going to prepare our fields, and we're going to sow well. That's the third point, if you're taking notes, is the Spirit leads us to sow well. Where are you sowing seeds? And what parts of your life are you tending and, and, and sowing into? Paul makes it clear. you got two fields you can sow into. You can sow into your flesh, and you know what you're going to reap from that? More flesh and corruption. You can sow into the Spirit and reap eternal life. So we sow and we reap. See, a lot of people would maybe look at this and say, is he talking about money? Is he talking about, like, corn? What are we talking about here? He's talking about personal holiness, Sow seeds in your life that's leading you to holiness. Amen. You sow in the flesh, you're going to lead to sin. You sow into the spirit, you're going to walk in holiness. 
Maybe you've heard this old saying, sow a thought, reap an act, sow an act, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, and sow a character, reap a destiny. See, we think, oh, it's just a little sowing a little seed over here in my flesh. It's not that big of a deal, man. It multiplies. We got to be careful where we're sowing seeds. This is what we're taking in what we're reading, what we're listening to, what we're watching. Once again, I'm not trying to be the police here and say, you shouldn't watch all this stuff. I'm just saying, be careful where you're sowing. Where do you spend the most of your time? Where do you spend the most of your money? Where do you spend, who do, who do you spend the most of your time with? Where are you sowing seeds? Because holiness is a harvest. And the seeds are our thoughts and our deeds. So where are we sowing? What seed are we using to sow that's going to lead to personal holiness, that's going to lead to a harvest of eternal life? I think this is something that we can all say we can sow better. We can be more careful about what we're sowing into. We're going to sow into our children. We're going to sow into our personal holiness. You know how you sow into your children? By sowing into your holiness. Personal holiness, you, you're, you're like, you're looking at your kids and you're like, why can't I, they understand this? Well, because you maybe don't have it all together. I'm not saying you have to have it all together, but sow into your field of spirit, into your holiness, see a reap a harvest out of your life of holiness, and then you can sow in and multiply into your children. So well. Look at verse 10. So then... As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I think it's interesting here. He says, hey, we're called to love on people. We're called to care for people and do good to people. But then he says, especially in the household of faith. Why? Because we're a family. Now, we're always welcoming more into the family, So we should be doing good to our city and to the lost and to other people. We're sharing the gospel with every person we can. But in the household of faith, we need each other. It is hard to walk in holiness. We need the power of the Spirit. And a lot of times, God's wanting to use brothers and sisters to bear our burdens and restore us and sow into us to help us walk in holiness. See, one of the major things that affects what we sow into is the community we surround ourselves with. Lack of good community hinders holiness, and lack of holiness hinders good community. So see how that works together. If you don't surround yourself with a good community of people that's going to love you enough to say the hard things to you, it's going to bear burdens for you whenever you don't even have to ask sometimes because they just know if you don't surround yourself with good community, it's going to affect your holiness. On the other side, if you're not walking in holiness, it's going to affect your community. See, a lot of us, we think, well, my sin is my sin. No, it's affecting the people around you, your friends, your church, right? Like, like we're all, when one hurts, we all hurt. And so we can be, think all the time, prideful. It's just my problems. No, it's our problems. And we're here to bear each other with gentleness, and we're going to seek restoration with gentleness. It is something we're called to do. If we're walking in the Spirit, we will seek restoration. It's not something, we should be trying to do it and intentional about it, but it should be flowing out of us if we're walking in the Spirit. We should be bearing each other's burdens without necessarily even having to go to it. It just naturally happens. Be intentional, but if you're walking in the Spirit, bearing burdens will happen. And we've got to sow well into our holiness. What I'm taking in and what I'm putting out for other people, I want to sow well. I'm going to close with this. If we look at the life of Jesus, he perfectly exemplifies these qualities. Doesn't he? If we look at the word and look at the life of Jesus and what, how he lives and going to the cross, what we're going to celebrate next week is we see Jesus. And I'm going to walk this backwards. I'm going to go backwards. Three, two, one, three. We see him sowing well in holiness because he was perfectly holy. That even when he was tempted and he was, they came at him from all sides, he was sowing into holiness and into other people. We see him constantly bearing burdens. In fact, on the cross, he bore the ultimate burden, right? 
Like he bore the burden of our sin that was ours and he took it on himself. This is Jesus sowing in holiness, bearing our burden of sin. And then we see him seeking restoration because that was the whole point of why he came. Was that he would go to the cross and restore us to God. That we would have right relationship with him. That we could know our father and have an intimate relationship to talk to him. That we could be saved and restored and to be a new creation. This is Jesus. Holy, bearing our sin and restoring us to God. So if these are the qualities of Jesus, then what should his believers look like? If this is Jesus and we are Christians, Christ followers, little Christ, we should look like this as well. We should be walking in holiness. We're there to bear each other's burdens and pick each other up and carry each other whenever we feel like we can't go on anymore. And even though it's awkward and those are tough conversations, we seek restoration because we love each other that much. Jesus could have said, nah, not my problem. They messed up. You know what? These people, these humans are actually pretty mean. Like I've been down here and I'm healing people and raising the dead and I'm going to die for them and they still hate me. Like they're chanting, they want me to die. Like he could have just been like, uh-uh, they deserve this. But Jesus, once again, I always go in the guard, says, not my will, but yours be done. He was seeking restoration. And so this is the gospel. And Jesus restores us to God. And if we place our faith in him, what he did on the cross, that he is the son of God, dying for our sins, resurrected in life. If we place our faith in him, confess our sins, repent of it, that we are saved. And when we're saved, we receive his spirit, which leads us into the family of God that is seeking restoration, bearing burdens, and sowing into holiness. So if you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you today that you can place your faith in him. You can come up and pray here at the front. If you have burdens that you're needing to let go of, you're needing to put those burdens on Jesus. You need to let, let go of those things. We have people that will come up and pray with you as we worship and pray. If you want to talk after the service, I'd love to talk with you. We have other people that would pray with you and talk with you. And if you want to know more about trusting Jesus, I would love to have that conversation. And if you're a believer in here, brothers and sisters, I think we got some work to do. I'm not saying this is a bad church because I think we do a really good job of trying to build community and care for each other, but we can do more. We can be more alert and aware of each other's burdens. We can seek restoration before it gets too out of control. We can go in love and gentleness and humility and care for each other. So I want to convict, I don't want to convict, I want the Spirit to convict us today that if we, what, what, what do we need to be doing better? Probably all three, but I think that we need to specifically look and the Spirit's going to speak to us as we pray and say, hey, listen, you struggle with bearing burdens. You really struggle at seeking restoration because you, you're scared you're going to make somebody mad. You know what? You're really caught up in your sin and you need to maybe start, st sit back and s sow into your holiness. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking that you would convict us right now. That we'd see that your spirit leads us to biblical community, to unity in the family of God, that we would care for each other, we would restore each other, that we'd bear one another's burdens, that we'd sow into our own holiness, but into each other's holiness as well. God, that we believe we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We know your timing is perfect and we're trusting you, God, that you will bring the harvest. You are the one that grows us and works in us and you are the one that does the restoration. You are the one that makes us a new creation. So God, help us to trust in you. Stop trying to do it on our own, but believe that you are the one that makes us new. You are the one that heals us and restores us. You are the one that saved us. God, help us to walk in the spirit that we could exemplify these, these characters, these characteristics of Jesus. And God, I pray right now, if there's anybody listening online or even here in person, God, that doesn't know you, that today would be the day 
they'd feel your conviction, they'd repent of themselves and their sin, and they would trust in Jesus. We thank you, God, and ask that you just have your way during this time of prayer and worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians, that God would, uh, Paul was writing to the Galatians, Lord, that it is still, still can be applied to our lives today. We still need that today. So Lord, as your church, your body of believers, Lord, would we be quick to listen to the letter Paul is writing in your word, Lord, because we need community. God, because you created us to need it to want it, to desire it. Lord, we cannot do life alone first and foremost. We need you, your spirit in and guiding our lives. And we need each other united by that same spirit to bear each other's burdens. And Lord, we get the strength to do that through the power of your spirit. God, it's not all in ourselves to bear our own and to bear this brother's and this sister's burden, but Lord, you give us the strength and the energy and the joy to bear in those burdens for others and with others. 
Lord, I pray if there's um, someone here that's lacking community, that feels alone or lonely, Lord, um, God, would you give them the boldness to plug in here? God, to seek that community, to seek your face in other people, to get in your word with other believers, to, to ask for and give permission for accountability. Lord, we need that. And Lord, would you, God, to strengthen the people in this church um, to be able to bear each other's burdens well, to give accountability well in love. Lord, would you work in us in that way? that we can truly disciple and be discipled. God, that should always be happening. We should always be being discipled and discipling another Lord. It's the way you intended it. God, you didn't ask us to just baptize and dunk them, but God, you said make disciples. So God, we don't care about numbers. God, it's not just a log book for us to check that we did this and this and this this year, but Lord, we wanna see you grow this church spiritually and numerically for the sake of your gospel and the sake of this fallen world. So God, would we glorify you in all that we do? God, would we see people saved and truly transformed and to live for your name's sake? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, church, we thank you for being here with us and worshiping with us here this morning. Um, again, as Pastor Nathan said, be inviting to Easter um, and prepare your heart for it. Be worshiping at home, be in the word at home, um, and ask God to open your heart to make the gospel new to you again. Be praying for the people that fill these seats if they've never received the gospel and salvation before that, that would be the day. Um, we know that God's capable of still saving and changing and transforming, so we're praying for that for Easter. And um, if this is your first time with us, please fill out a digital connect card. You can find that in link of the bio of the live stream. Um, you can also use this for prayer requests and um, needs. Just indicate what those are. If you want to plug in serving, we always need that. Um, so please fill one of those out. And if you call Vision Church your home and you want to worship through giving, and um, we have texts to give, we have the Church Center app, um, and you can give on our website or here in person to keep the ministries of this church going. And before I forget, we are doing a child dedication service. Um, we announced this last week, but we have an official date. We're going to go ahead and do it Sunday, April 18th. And um, so it's not just for babies, it's for all children. Um, if you're a part of this church, if this is the body that you've committed to um, in Christ and you want to dedicate your children to the Lord, you can do that. We want to indicate this isn't salvation and um, this isn't a confirmation. This is just you saying as a single parent or as a family, I give this life to the Lord because the Lord entrusted me to raise this child as a disciple of Christ. And then as a church, we want to commit to those children that we want to be a part of that process and pray for the parents and the families in that. So if you want to be a part of that, please send us a message on our Facebook page with your kids' names, the parents' um, names, and indicate that you want to be a part of that. And then last but not least, sorry, there's a lot going on. We have softball signups. Um, it's a community league this year, but if you want to be a part of our church team, we have a sign up in the lobby. Just put your t-shirt size, your phone number, and say that you want to be a part of it, and we'll add you to a Facebook group where there's updates and all that good stuff. So again, church, thank you for being a part of this community, a part of this family. We'll see you next week.